We've already discussed the German Gewehr 98 rifle, introduced by Paul Mauser, but at 9 pounds and over 49 inches long, it really wasn't the most portable gun. What Germany needed was a new carbine to replace the Car 88 and standardize on the new 1898 action. It sounds easier than it would prove to be. Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the Carabiner 98AZ short rifle. Let's take a look in that light box. Weighing in at 8 pounds and 43.3 inches, it chambers the 792 by 57 millimeter cartridge, feeding 5 from a stripper clip into a fixed staggered box magazine. The first thing some of you are probably wondering is why I called this the AZ instead of the A, and in that case, which one is the A? Or which one's the AZ, or who's wrong or who's right here, and what were the Polish carrying, and it gets a little confusing. Let's go ahead and get a little context history, just to sort of sort out where the name originally came from by the time we're in World War I, and then when we get a little further into the episode, I'll reveal where the change happened on us. Germany had already issued the Car 88 and Gewehr 91 rifles for cavalry and artillery, respectively. These were simple shortenings of the Gvar 88, and we will see them in more detail in future episodes. Germany would repeat these patterns early on with the Gvar 98, introducing both the Cavalry Car 98 and the Artillery Car 98. Really the difference being the inclusion of a stacking hook. Otherwise they're basically the same model. Now these are true carbines and sit at 37.2 inches in length. Very handy. Next up, Germany would realize that producing two variant carbines, neither of which with a bayonet mount, is confusing and sort of wasteful. So they consolidated onto one design, featuring a cleaning rod and a bayonet mount. This terrifically awkward looking gun is the Car 98 A, where A stands for these German words, meaning with attachment for bayonet 98. By the way, those are the best representations we can give of those early models. A lot of them had more than one pattern that's been found through history, and there isn't a lot of paperwork left on them. It's mostly through observation that we know a lot about them anyway. Uh, the point being, though, is there was still tinkering going on all the way up to 1905-1906, and finally the Germans said enough. When the Spitzer cartridge came out, this really pushed it over the edge, though, because it really didn't perform in those very short, very light carbines. It was just excessive recoil, excessive muzzle blast, and you know, it might not be a big problem for you, the shooter, but remember when we were talking about those uh, labels earlier, the thought pattern is still to have men firing in lines with two lines minimum, so they expect to have somebody's muzzle sitting alongside of somebody else's head, and in those carbines, that really is going to shake your aim. Now obviously we know, you know, with hindsight that that line theory was going to go right out the window by the time we get to World War I, but at the time they didn't. So they made some decisions based off of the new cartridge and the idea that they needed just enough barrel to be able to have men line up and not disturb each other. And that's where we get into this guy. You see, they went with the minimum possible barrel they could while still getting good performance out of that without excessive you know, recoil and muzzle blast. They even went so far as to try to shorten up the buttstock, but that idea actually got abandoned. One thing they did keep, interestingly enough, is they took a whole centimeter out of the trigger system by sort of changing the angle on it. And if you look, I'll get my head out of the way for a second, it actually kind of curves in up under the floor plate. Let's just get a picture in here, that'll be easier. There we go, nice comparison. So anyway, Germany's working their way through what is now going to be a short rifle, and they're not blind to what's going on overseas. You see in Britain and the US, you see things like the short magazine Lee Enfield and the Springfield 1903 both being adopted as standard short rifles, universal short rifles. Germany's not ready to get rid of the Gewehr 98 as an infantry rifle, but they are ready to combine cavalry, artillery, fortress troops, communications troops, engineers, everybody they can that is not front line. They're ready to combine them all on one rifle coming from, you know, one pattern so that they can really focus down on efficient manufacturing. And that's going to be this gun. 
Let's go ahead and get a closer look at some of these little details though. We're sad to say that this example has been refinished as the bolt should be in the white, but otherwise it should serve us just fine for this demonstration. Now in terms of the action, the gun's virtually identical to the Gvar 98. The only difference really is the outer diameter of the receiver has been shaved down to lighten it up. The interior measurements are the same. I mean, you can put a Gvar 98 bolt in this thing. Otherwise, we're really looking at cosmetics and configuration. So first, while we're right here, we have a nice undercut and a turned down bolt with a checkered underside for easier manipulation and grip. And most notably, this thing is side slung. This makes it appropriate for cavalry and anybody else that's actually working with their hands or riding, not just marching. Now, special to this gun again is the regular tangent rear leaf sight. We'll actually see the Gavar 98 come around to this post-war. It's much better, honestly, in order to see your target and less of the sight itself. Up at the front, we have a hinged front barrel band. We have our stacking hook. We have our bayonet lug, which is fitted way up to the end of the muzzle because they were no longer using muzzle rings that wrapped around the barrel. They just used the lug as the mounting point. Also, we have front sight protectors unique to this gun, but common in later Mauser models because it proved to be so useful. And this little overhang here, right there, that guy that my fingernail's under, he's actually there so that you can fit a muzzle protector. We happen to have one. It goes on and it's a little hard to do one-handed for the camera, but wah, twists right up under and it lips there. Also, poot. Now I know you guys are getting kind of used to seeing an animation every single episode. Sorry I've spoiled you, but this gun doesn't differ enough to be worth that effort. There's just a slight angle change in the trigger and otherwise it's the Gavar 98 all over again. So if you want to, you can flip back to that episode and relive it for a few moments, but otherwise, let's just go ahead and hand this thing off to May and get it shot for everybody's enjoyment. Just like the Gvar 98, we'll load five rounds of 7.92 from a stripper clip. Bolt forward. <laughs> Boom. Quick look at that target. All right, back to the nerd stuff. We do a lot of work to capture the full range of the rifle sound and not blow out your speakers. Let me assure you though, this is a very loud short rifle. All right, this thing served through World War I, which is what we most remember it for, very fairly. It was given pretty widely to any troops that weren't considered front line, and then it still made its way up to the front line on occasion. Although still, if you're looking at photos, you're really not gonna see as many of these as you will see the Gavar 98 right up in the trenches. Doesn't mean it wasn't important though. It served its role very, very well. These were also given to the Ottomans, so it fought the British in that theater as well. Now, wartime modifications did happen. Just like the Gavar 98, these guys received a stock ferrule for takedown and some inleted finger grooves on the stock. Also, they inspired a change in the bayonets. You see, starting with the Gavar 98, the Germans had ditched the muzzle ring and let the lug bear all the weight. On the carbine, this placed the wood grips of the bayonet ahead of the muzzle, and the excessive blast began scorching them. So, a steel backing, known as a flash guard, was introduced in 1915 to prevent additional damage. The service life for this gun is actually going to be fairly short, though, not for any fault of its, but because of really the end of the war. The Treaty of Versailles limited the German production and uh, inventory for the military, and so this thing sort of fell to the wayside. At the time, 
Carbine short rifles, these are considered police weapons and second line weapons. They're not considered the creme de la creme of military maneuvering and power. So when Germany was allotted a certain number of carbines for issuing, they sort of did an end run around the rules. This gets into the naming convention, actually. You see, they took Gewehr 98s and modified them in order to fit under the heading of a carbine. This was in name only, and really the updates were a turned down bolt handle and flat tangent sights. To differentiate these, the Carabiner 98B would be the reworked Gavar 98, and the AZ became, retroactively, the Carabiner 98A. Not the same A we saw earlier, a lowercase a. Hence the confusion. The now Car 98A would continue to serve really through World War II. We see them in inventory from time to time, but production stopped. A big reason for this is honestly because the special configuration of the trigger and that milled receiver, it just wasn't completely interchangeable with the Gavar 98, and that caused, you know, planning problems, manufacturing problems. Instead, we see the creation and adoption of the Car 98K, again in another episode. Uh, the 98AZ would go on to serve with Poland, who made their own copy with a slightly modified stacking hook and some other little features, but again, another episode. Now, these guns really did prove the concept of a short rifle, though, and led the way to a lot of other designs adopted, both in Germany and in other markets. If you want to see that your Car 98AZ stayed in service with the Germans post-war, Check the receiver. You'll often find a 1920 stamp there. That's actually an ownership mark. It's meant to differentiate this government inspected and owned model from any that were privately liberated and held in somebody's basement somewhere. That's a great little factoid there. Uh, plenty of these also saw service in other theaters because they were given away to various victors of the Entente and they turn up in all sorts of battlefields really into the 40s. All right. Let's go ahead and get May's opinion on actually shooting this thing, though. All right, little set shuffling, and we have May with us again. You're the shooter. Here you go. Thank you. Why don't you let us know how you really feel about this one? And uh, coming from the Gavar 98, let's talk about that rear sight that you didn't really like on the long rifle. How's it doing on the carbine? This is actually a much better improvement for me. These tangent leaf sights are so simple and easy to read. They're much flatter compared to the Gavar 98. Yeah, I've been trying to track down the history of the tangent sight. It looks like it may have come out of Norway. Anybody that's watching, if you know the oldest possible gun that has that simple setup, let me know. Um, so far, it seems like Norway's got the record on this one. But anyway, they tend to get used on almost everything after this point. I mean, they really are the standard. And it's interesting to note that they were originally offered on that prototype Gavar 98. They just went with the Lange Vizier anyway. I, I don't know why. All right, well, back to this gun. What do you think about the overall action compared to the Gavar 98? You know, don't get me wrong, I don't miss the Gavar 98, but what I do miss is a straight bolt handle. And you can obviously tell this one's been refinished, so this actually did make the action a little stickier, and the turn bolt isn't quite easy to get enough leverage underneath it. But I can see where they tried to make up for it. They carved out this little notch in the wood and they, they put a little bit of checkering underneath the bolt handle to try to make it easier to function. So they tried, but this was, the action wasn't that smooth to me. You know, a lot of us prefer a turn down handle because it deposits our finger next to the trigger, but we also have a fair bit of upper body strength considering that most of you watching are male. When May got out there and we had this thing trying to fire from the shoulder at first, we found that our sort of inferior ammo combined with the refinished action was making it stick real bad. And the usual response to that is to just go ahead and give it a nice slap. But, turn down bolt, you can't exactly slap. You gotta get your hand in there and, I don't know, it's kind of like a Kill Bill moment with your way punching out of a coffin. You just don't have the wind up. So it took a little grunting. All right. Back to the gun yet again. What do you think about this rifle as a short rifle? So we're talking about like recoil and handling. They did a lot to lighten this gun. It is shorter and the weight's easier to handle. 
What I wasn't expecting, though, was the recoil of this thing. I mean, we, I've handled Carnity 8s before. I, we had the Bertie's, and I thought those were going to be the worst. But so far, this has had some of the worst kick out of all the guns we've shot to date. Okay, so it sounds like what you're saying is that this really is the Gavar 98 action over again with some improved handling. You don't care for the turn down bolt handle because it's hard for you to get leverage. You don't care for the recoil as much, even though realistically you've seen just about as much recoil out of other guns. There's just something about this one that it didn't feel right. Um, I guess we're kind of down to that last question because there's not a lot of other differences here. Would you take this into battle? You know, compared to the Gavar 98, this is a better choice. I mean, the overall weight of the gun is much easier to handle. I could see myself running with this. The sights are cleaner. The few things that I issues with, the recoil and the turn down bolts, uh, they're minor things on the battlefield. I could see adrenaline pumping through me and this bolt not being a big deal at all. So, yeah, I would take it into battle. I just, this wasn't my favorite, and I guess I was expecting more out of it. I... I guess I'm just waiting, still waiting for my World War I sweetheart. All right, well, I guess that wraps up the 98AZ or A, depending on what time you're sort of looking at this from. Uh, we, again, just to remind you guys one final time, we're not doing our wrap outs here anymore. We're actually putting them at the end of the credits. Uh, and otherwise, thank you for watching with us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Hey everyone, I'm sorry for the low quality on this one. I'm sort of doing it by myself. The whole house was hit by a plague. Luckily, there's not a lot to announce this week. Um, we have plenty of things in the fire, but nothing's quite tempered enough to be ready to talk about just yet. Just know we have some things in the works. Um, there's probably gonna be about two months where we're sort of sitting tight and holding on the Patreon funds to try to build them up for something a little better. Um, they are currently sitting at 650-ish, which is great. Thank you for all that support. Um, we're still going to be making videos, though. Don't panic. There's going to be an episode every other week. It's just that we're sort of reaching for something bigger. Um, the other thing is t-shirts. We partnered with a company. They're doing these, you know, hand silk screen. They're great. There's only a couple designs out yet, but I just put across a bunch of ideas last night, so we'll see if that grows. Um, other than that, nothing really moving from our side, but I did want to make sure that I said thank you to everyone because I think I've received an update every hour or so that somebody has commented and it's always positive. It's always great. And honestly, where we're at with the project, we're not taking any kind of paycheck yet. So, you know, that encouragement is really all that's fueling us. So we need it and we're very glad to have it. So if you want sort of a fan challenge, for this week, um, go ahead and show the show to somebody else. Just get us out there. All right, thanks a lot.